Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Friday night's Hidden Hour. We are going to have a full weekend of Hidden Hours. We're going to do a Hidden Hour tonight, obviously. Here we are tonight. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Let your friends know we got the link out late. But we're also going to be doing one tomorrow. We have so much to talk about when it comes to the Alec Murdoch trial and the Alec Murdoch family that we decided to split it up into two nights. Tonight, we're going to talk about Alex, Alec Murdoch's testimony. We're going to break it down. It's been fascinating. We've been glued to the TV and watching some commentary as well. And I know that Dr. John has some things to say, and we have a lot of great questions from all of you, our hidden gems. So that's going to be tonight's topic. And then tomorrow, uh, Thank you so much for the support we received in talking about multi-generational shame. And we're going to continue that conversation with the Murdoch family part two. John has been watching, researching, and he has more things to say. So that'll be tomorrow night. At the end of this live, it should lead to the link for tomorrow. So we hope to see you tonight and tomorrow. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for liking. If you do like this video, those likes help us uh, in the YouTube algorithms. So thank you so much. With that, we will begin. Uh, a few people reached out while we were watching the trial, I want to say, and I asked for everyone's questions and comments, and a couple people actually commented on this. Let me start with uh, Debbie. Can I share what Debbie said? Uh, it was the most interesting thing, I think, when it came to Alec Murdoch's testimony today, the prosecution uh, discussing things with him. Debbie writes, in today's hearing, the prosecutor uh, brought up shame and family annihilator. Someone's listening to you on the prosecution team, winky face. <laughs> well, that is very sweet, Debbie, to, to consider. Uh, it was interesting <laughs> that they brought shame up. And I think that's where we want to start. Can I share a video, John? Yeah, please do. All right. I think it was a, yeah, it was a astonishing moment for me. So let's, let's listen to it. All right. And uh, why don't you put your mic on mute, John, while I get okay. this ready yep. and we will share. Shame for you, I asked this before, but shame for you is an extraordinary provocation, isn't it, Mr. Murdoch? Shame for me is an extraordinary provocation. I don't like to be shamed. The prospect of humiliating the legacy is an extraordinary provocation to you, isn't it, Mr. Murdoch? What do you mean by an extraordinary provocation? It, it affects you deeply. It's your biggest concern, is it not? No, that's not my biggest concern. You're a middle-aged man like me? I'm 54 years old. I'm not sure. You look like you're in better shape than me, so I don't know. I was actually a couple of years behind you in law school, but we never knew each other, did we? I never knew you, no, sir. Had a very successful career up until this point. You know, Simple question. And the answer to that is no, Mr. Waters. I was an addict for more than 20 years. All right. So out. So making millions of dollars over, over a decade is not having a successful career. Is that what you're going to tell the jury? No, that's not a successful career when you. Okay. Well, let me put it no, like hang this. On. Let, me, let me just. All right. Go ahead. Just, You know, it may have been what you perceive as a successful career, but, you know, I was the one who was fighting that. You don't have a very high self-esteem when you're an addict. So 
I, I don't deem myself a success. Would you agree that at least outwardly you're perceived as successful? <clears throat> I made I made I made a bunch of money. If that's what you're wanting to to, to get at. No, I'm actually asking about the perception. You were perceived as a prominent, I tried powerful to be. lawyer. How I was perceived. You were president I don't of the know. trial lawyer. I sure tried to be. Lived a life of possessing authority. Possessing authority? Yeah, we saw the badges. You just admitted of your prominence in the legal community. I don't think that I lived a life of possessing authority. I never saw myself as that way. You don't think you lived a life of privilege? I think I was very privileged. But as we move to June of 2021, you were suffering from a drug addiction? Absolutely. Your father was terminally ill? When? In, I mean, as we move to June of 2021. No, sir. He, he, he was, was very ill. He was very ill. And you were coming to a point of financial crisis. I, I was, I was having financial issues like I'd had many times in the past. Mr. Murdoch, are you a family annihilator? A family annihilator? You mean like, did I shoot my wife and my son? Yes. No. I would never hurt Maggie Murdoch. I would never hurt Paul Murdoch under any circumstances. Say that. Excuse me? You say that, but you lied to Maggie, didn't you? I did lie to Maggie. You lied to Paul? Sometimes. You lied to your father? I'm sure I did at some point. Did you tell him all the stuff you'd been up to over the years before he died? No, I didn't tell him. Did you lie to your brothers? About financial things? Yes. I would have lied to Randy at some point, I'm sure. Did you lie to him about the last time you saw your wife and son alive? I did. Did you lie to their wives? I'm sure I did. Did you lie to Marion Proctor? Yes. Did you lie to Bart Proctor? Yes. Did you lie to the Brandstutters? Yes. Did you lie to your best friend, Chris Wilson? Probably. Did you lie to your other friend, Barrett Bulware, when you took his money? No, sir. No. Not I, I didn't lie like I told you. I didn't lie directly to him. I lied to him by a mission like like we talked about. I mean, he was he, I didn't talk to him. I didn't see him at that time. Did you lie to your law partners? I did. Did you lie to him about the kennels? Some of them. Did you lie to Mark Ball? Uh yeah, I believe, based on what Mark said, I believe I did. Did you lie to Ronnie Crosby? According to what he said, I believe I did. Did you lie to Johnny Parker? I don't believe I ever discussed that with Johnny. Did you lie to him about the finances when you borrowed that money in July of 2021? Um, I don't know if I lied to him about... I, I, I don't, Johnny, I don't think Johnny... Would, Ask me. I don't think I had to lie to Johnny about that, so I don't know. Well, 
It was interesting. Uh, a few people did say that they thought of your analysis and uh, what you discussed about family shame when they watched that part of the trial today. What are your thoughts, Dr. John? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's accurate. I think that I think that most reasonable people would see that Alex is someone who suffers with shame and this is a family filled with shame. So I, I'm not sure. I, don't, I wouldn't be willing to take credit for that. But nevertheless, it was an extraordinary moment for me because shame, I think, is a huge part of this case. And the fact that the prosecutor had the courage to bring it up, I think, was was really important. And it threw Alex for a bit of a loop, by the way. He he didn't know what to make of that. I think he was it kind of pushed him back on his feet a little bit. And you know, it, it, keep in mind that Alec was in drug addiction treatment. Remember, he was. They sent him yes. to drug addiction treatment for months after the murder. So this is a guy who's been in treatment. You would anticipate that they've talked about shame or at least self-esteem. He does bring that up, but he still doesn't seem to understand what that means. He's still thrown aback by that. So that that's what kind of threw me for a loop. Is I. I saw that and I mean I was I was a little bit surprised that the prosecutor asked that. I think it was a great question, but I think he took Alex by surprise even though Alex had been in treatment for many months. And so usually people that are in drug addiction treatment for a few months, they pick up the language of therapy and they kind of know what to do with those types of questions and it's this guy seems like Alex Alex seems like someone who's never been in treatment for a day because he just he didn't he didn't understand the question he didn't understand what shame provocation was he seemed thrown for a bit of a loop and maybe that was maybe that was Creighton Waters point and and by the way a shout out to Creighton Waters i think he did a marvelous job i've seen some criticisms of the fact that the prosecution is letting alex talk too much and they're kind of giving him more rein than most most prosecutors might in terms of expecting yes or no answers, but I'm, I'm going to totally disagree with that. And, and I'll explain that in a minute. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to you sharing that. Uh, there are a few questions here. You know, a lot of this had to do with the fact that he's admitted to lying. His defense right. attorneys have admitted that Alec is a liar. He's mm -hmm. admitting that he's a liar. Right. He's admitting that he lied about his alibi, that he was indeed at the kennels when he said he was not, uh, you know, and he wanted to take to the stand to explain himself. So a lot of this prosecution talking to Alec Murdaugh has to do with lying mm -hmm. and how much yeah. lying is lying. And we have a question actually here from Evan. Well, a couple of questions. And I have to ask, do habitual liars often reach the point where they have trouble telling their own truths from their lies? Do you think Alec has reached that point here? They, they ask another, is it your experience? Yeah, that they often believe their own lies or can convince them of their own lies. And do you think this is likely with Alec Murdaugh? Yeah, it, it's an interesting question. I think this issue of pathological lying is something that would require more time than we probably have tonight. But there, there is something in, in a branch of psychology called social cognition that it's called the sleeper effect. And that is essentially that the more often you tell a lie about something, the more likely you are to believe it and the more likely the people around you are to believe it. And so it's actually similar to the, you know, I think Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi guy, propagandist, was famous for saying something similar, that if you tell a lie often enough, people believe it. But the, we have a term for that in psychology called the sleeper effect. And I think it's possible that there may be some of that, but I, I'm a little skeptical. I think with Alec, I think that Alec is used to controlling the narrative and he's used to because he's a Murdoch and he has a lot of power he's used to controlling the narrative and when he when he when he tells you something that 
often it's going to be believed. You know, if, if you take something as simple as the name Murdoch, or if you take something as simple as the name Alexander, and you change that to, if you change the, the name, it's spelled Murdoch, but if you change it to Murdoch, and you change the name Alex, as in Alexander, to Alec. Now, I'm someone who happens to be a big fan or very interested in Alexander the Great, who's, you know, from Macedonia, who basically took over a big chunk of the world pretty quickly. He's a fascinating figure to me. And his name is Alexander. I've never once considered calling him Alec Xander because his name is Alexander. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what's my point? My point is that if you change little bits of reality, like your name, you're trying to control the narrative, right? You're telling people, my name is Alexander, but I'm going to have you call me Alec because I am going to force you to bend reality to fit my need or my beliefs or whatever it is, right? I mean, I don't know the genesis. I don't know how this word, I don't know how he goes from Alexander to Alec. I presume it has something to do with from being from the South, maybe. I don't know. Maybe something to do with naming in the South. But but either way, when you when, when your name is Alexander and you force people to call you Alec, in some ways, you're 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 bending reality, and I think that's what that's what line is about. Line <laughs> is about trying to create a new reality from evidence that doesn't really exist. So you're sh you're trying to shape the narrative, and it's about power because you're trying to get people to believe that reality. And if you take something as simple as Alex's name or Alex's name, he's doing that. He's doing that with something as simple as his name. Now, I'm not arguing that he's going from that to this larger issue of pathological lying, but I'm saying that you, you take these little pieces of the puzzle and you put them together and you can see how somebody like this can engage in this type of lying over time. I, I should also mention that pathological lying is often tied to unreliable parenting. And so in families where there's a lot of mixed messages, especially between the parents, children get confused about what to believe and who's telling the truth and who's not. And some children will fixate on certain versions of reality that might involve lying to try to make sense of the world because neither parent is super reliable. So, so I think a lot of children who begin lying, they're in families that are very conflicted and there's a lot of mixed messages and also you get you get pathological line from what I would call narcissistic families. And those are families where essentially parents control the narrative in the family and the children have to conform to that narrative. So, so the children don't really develop a voice of their own. The children react to the needs of the parents. Now, normal, you know, healthy parenting should be that the parents are reacting to the needs of the children and reading the needs of the children. But when you live with the narcissist or you're in a narcissistic family and a narcissist, usually the male figure controls the family, that figure controls the narrative and that figure wants most of the attention. And so the children will shape their worlds and their reality to fit the needs and expectations of the parent of the narcissist. And that creates a lot of distortions of the world and a lot of distortions of reality. And that can lead to a lot of lying. So if you look at the Murdoch family and you look at somebody like handsome, who again, let's use, you know, we talked about the name handsome, how and it, it's a peculiar, I guess you could argue that maybe it's a bit of a fun name, but I think it's also a peculiar name in the sense that he's having the grandchildren refer to him in a very adoring way, in a very, I don't know, for lack of a, in a very narcissistic way, almost. He wants reflected back to him the fact that he's handsome. Now, do I, do I think that handsome's a narcissist? I don't know. I have no idea. But, but my point is, it's a little unusual. It's not hard to imagine that somebody like handsome might have some narcissistic features and might have children who have a distorted view of the world or reality, and they start lying to create their own version of reality that makes sense to them. Some people are pointing out, hey, that's the Southern way of saying Alex. Although I will say that my good friends in the South, some of them say they've never heard it pronounced that way. Uh, 
there's a lot of opinion. Some people say they switch the pronunciation of their name. Of course, I, I'm one of those. My name is Lauren. Some people pronounce it Lauren. But but uh, I think the point that Dr. John is trying to make is that it, there's multiple subtle things in his life that are snowballing into something bigger about how reality is bent. And that's that's the point he's trying to make here, no matter the difference right, of right. opinions but, as far as the pronunciation of his name or why he changed his name. There's an appearance going on here. There's a facade going on here. And, yeah, and they've yeah. done it in subtle ways for years. Right. You take you take something as simple as a name and you you change it a little bit. Even even the last name Murdoch, which, you know, to me, when I first saw this case, I said, oh, the Murdoch's. But no, it's it's not pronounced that way. And so so, you know, I call them Murdoch's because that's how they call themselves. But but the point is that I think there's a little bit of a distortion there. And uh, I don't know why. Right. It, it doesn't really necessarily add up again. Maybe you can say that it's a Southern thing, but when you start taking these little distortions, as you just said, and they start snowballing, then over time you start seeing the entire world, the entire picture of your world becomes distorted. Yes. Yes. Some great questions here. And, and we have a shorter show today. Uh, again, we're going to do a brief summary of our thoughts on Alec Murdoch's testimony because we have so many thoughts coming down and so many questions. And then tomorrow we're going to continue discussing shame. Here's a great, great question from our listener, Tad. What did you make of him talking baby talk, calling his son Paul Paul or Papa when referencing him? Each time. I, I think he's trying to be more relatable. He's trying to be a little more sympathetic. He's trying to be a more, you know, a little more homely in the sense that he's presenting this kind of down to earth Southern family that isn't, that doesn't have the kind of privilege and wealth that they have. I mean, he's obviously not telling you about the chartering the private jets and going to the Super Bowl and flying all over the country and going to these big parties. And, you know, you're not, you're not seeing the part of him that, that was shown in the Netflix documentary, for example, about a family that's beyond privileged and they, they flaunt their wealth. And so I, I think that's a way of trying to make himself more relatable to the jury. He's trying to be as Southern as he can be. He's trying to appeal to them. After all, he doesn't, he's not appealing to us. He's not appealing to the, to the millions and millions of people around the world watching this. He's appealing to 12 people in the jury box. So, I loved it when the prosecution called him out and said, said, you know, you're calling him Papa, but in every interview previous yeah. to this testimony, you have never called him Papa. You've always called him Paul. And right. he, he didn't look very happy by them pointing that out, but it's true. I had not heard that nickname until today. And we've seen and heard so much from him. And he has always called him Paul until today. Yeah. Uh, do you think this is a question from from uh, Arlene? Do you think he continuously brings up his addiction for sympathy, or is it an excuse? I think you know an excuse or sympathy. I think that's that's part of the defense strategy. That I think they really don't know how to make a strong argument about his motives so or why he wouldn't do this so they're saying in effect that he's essentially saying the drugs made me do it in other words lie not not commit the murders they're trying to avoid that but the, the drugs made him steal money and they they the drugs made him do all of these horrible illegal behaviors, not anything else. So I, I think they're trying to, it's an easy out for them. It's, it's, it's allowing them to explain everything in terms of the drug addiction rather than the reality of what's going on. Okay. Um, Mary asks, sorry, I just lost it. Here we are. 
Mary asks, Alex mentioned that drug users like him often have low self-esteem. Do you think that is the case here? Or is Alex just saying that because he felt it was a statement they may benefit in some way? And we heard him discuss that his low self-esteem. Well, yeah, this is this is this is gonna open the door for the, the main point I want to discuss tonight. And that is I, you know, I, I've looked at, at some of the commentary and people talking about the case, and I, they're talking about, are the tears real? Are the jury going to feel sympathetic to them? Do they believe the tears? Blah, blah, blah. I think those comments are interesting, but I, I think they're really missing the bigger picture here. And, you know, I could be wrong about this, but I'm, I'm approaching this from a psychological perspective. Most of the commentators are lawyers. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer a bit of an analysis that's a little different. And I think, I think the reason why Creighton Waters is so effective is because he's showing us who Alec Murdoch is in real time. And the reason he's doing that is because he's being evocative and he's getting Alex to feel shame and some emotions that he does not want to experience. So what you're seeing with Alec on the stand is you're seeing someone who's moody, he's impetuous, he's defensive, he's oppositional, he's defiant, he's controlling, and he's power obsessed. And you see this in subtle ways that he pushes back, he lashes, like, okay, you see this in many ways. Number one, he doesn't answer a lot of questions directly. So he's oppositional in the sense that he refuses to give answers, direct answers to Creighton. He's also many times during the trial or, you know, when he was on the stand, he would lash out at Creighton. So uh, I'm trying to think of a few moments. There were, there were some moments when Creighton Waters was trying to get him to discuss specific instances of fraud with specific clients and Alec kept reverting back to reverting back to a, a broad statement, a blanket statement about I did wrong. What I did was wrong. Yes, I stole, but he couldn't give him a specific instance. Thank and you. you. Oh. Sorry, Sorry, go ahead. Thank you for bringing this up. Keep going with this, where you're going. Sorry. You could tell, you could tell that he was getting angry. You could tell that, that you know, there were times when there was, there was a moment during that particular testimony when he said, let's get this done quickly. So, you know, I mean, when somebody, when you're on the stand and you're fighting for your life and you say to the prosecutor, let's get this done quickly, who's in control? Is Creighton Waters in control or is Alec Murdoch in control? Alec Murdoch is being placed in a position that he's never been in before. And that is he's in a, what we call psychologists call it a one down position, meaning he's the one who doesn't have the power anymore. And because he doesn't have the power, he's experiencing some shame. And here's, here's a really important point for the first time in his life. He's probably experiencing some real helplessness and a real loss of control. Now, and this gets to the line too. A lot of the line is about trying to gain the upper hand on the narrative, trying to gain the upper hand on what's being said publicly and, and ways to avoid family shame and ways to perpetuate the family myth, which the family myth is essentially, this is a family that's rich, powerful, untouchable, perfect, and we deserve everything we get because we're entitled and special and privileged and all that stuff. So he's trying to perpetuate the family myth. And if you don't think, by the way, that the family is on the same page or invested in the family myth, then just look at who's sitting behind him. All of his siblings are there suggesting that they're all supportive. This is a family that the term family therapist sometimes uses a mesh. They're deeply a mesh. They deeply support each other to the point where their identities probably merge with one another. They will do anything to protect each other. And that's your motive. In the end, I think that's your motive. We'll get to that in a second. But the question about the tears, the question about the tears is, is an important one because I would say that because Alec Murdoch is feeling helplessness for the first time in his life, 
I think the tears are actually coming from a place of not, not just shame. I think there's some shame there, but a sense of being helpless. There might, you could argue that there's a little bit of grief in there. And I think there probably is, but that's not the primary reason he's crying. He's crying because he doesn't, he can't, he's probably just completely flabbergasted that he's in this position, that he's on the stand fighting for his life. And that for the first time in his life, he's giving up control and he has to sit there being embarrassed by this prosecutor, by Creighton Waters. And he feels helpless. And I think a lot of his tears are, so he is experiencing shame on the stand. And I think a lot of his tears are coming from that place of feeling helpless. Are these genuine tears of remorse? I doubt it. You know, the, the fact that, the fact that you can see him oscillate between, he's oscillating constantly on the stand between shame and control and anger. So shame and control slash anger. That's why he will lash out. That's why he's so moody. And that's why he's lashing out so much because he's going between the sense of helplessness and this desire to get control back, which looks like anger, but it's, it's, it's an attempt to reassert his power. You see it all the time. He says something. There's a couple of times where he said, hang on, Mr. Waters, as in like, stop and listen to me, acknowledge me, pay attention to me. Right? So that's that's power. You see these little power plays. If you were to if you were to pull some of the video and go through certain segments, I could show you so many points where Alec Murdoch is trying to establish or reassert power with Creighton Waters because he's never probably experienced that. The Murdochs don't know what it's like to be in a one down position, and they do not know what it's like to feel helpless and to have a loss of control. And the response to that, which you're seeing with Alec on the stand, the response is defiance, oppositional behavior. He's defensive. I think that's what's going on here. So the irony is that the irony of, of Creighton Waters asking about shame is that he's been eliciting shame for a day and a half with Alec on the stand. And he's showing you, Alec is showing you real time what it's like to feel helpless and ashamed. And he is exhibiting the very behaviors. And this is a really critical point. The jury's probably not going to see this or get this, but he's showing you why he might be capable of committing murder. And what I mean by that is that you see the anger, you see the control, you see the defensiveness, you see the moodiness, you see the impulsivity, you see the defiance. Those are all things that, if taken to an extreme, they can lead to murder. And so, so ironically, the very thing that Creighton Waters is trying to do or trying to prove, he's doing it real time, and Alec is showing us who he is. He's not some laid-back, super nice guy, super chill guy that, you know, has been in treatment for three months and he's come to terms with his shame and he's good and now he's telling the truth. No, that's not what you're seeing. You're seeing someone who's really angry, who occasionally expresses tears because he feels helpless and ashamed, but then he, he circles right back. He returns right back to the anger and the lashing out and that's what's going on. And so, you know, there's, there's an important part of this narrative that, that I, I haven't seen the, def or the prosecution talk about. And that is to me, this is the final piece of the puzzle, but Alec Murdoch has a history of violence that has not been talked about as far as I can tell. Maybe it's because those charges were never formally, those charges were dismissed, but there was at least one time when Alec was 25 years old, he was, I believe he was on Hilton Head Island and he was in a bar fight and he assaulted a bouncer very severely. And the police were called out. Of course, they all knew who he was. They knew he was a Murdoch. He was never, as far as I know, he was never formally arrested, but I believe there was a police report issued over that incident. And, and I, I think that because of his family's influence, Handsome got the charges dismissed really quickly. But there is a record of that. And 
that's not the only incident. That's not the only bar fight. He was well known in college to have gotten in multiple bar fights. I believe there was another incident. Maybe I don't remember exactly when we, you know, we, we haven't had time to really dig deep into these sources. So I assume the prosecution has, and they probably, they probably, you know, they probably weren't able to use it because they weren't formal charges. I don't know, but but the final piece to this puzzle is that Alec Murdoch does have some history of violence when he was younger and he was, there was some police involvement. And so again, not only are we seeing someone who on the stand who was showing us who he is, but we also have someone who is, has a lot of antisocial characteristics, right? He has, he has a lot of antisocial features that would include drug addiction, fraud, financial fraud, some past history of violence, which has not been discussed. Uh, you know, th th there's this is someone who I think has the potential. There, the defense is implying that this is someone who would only, you know, that's fairly benign and only would commit financial fraud, but that's not true. That's not what his real history, I think, shows. So, so I think that's the most interesting part of of Alec on the stand that's that's really not being talked about is that this guy, again, I, I'm repeat. I know I've repeated this a bunch of times, but this guy's really giving us a glimpse of who he is and why he can commit murder. So, and and I I I don't know, but I'm guessing that I I'm that the prosecution. Well, let, let's talk about the Netflix documentary and Morgan. Morgan knows the Murdoch family extremely well. She dated Paul for four years, and she says straight up in the Netflix documentary, I believe Alex Murdoch, Alec Murdoch was capable of murdering Paul and Maggie. What does Morgan know that she's not telling us? I don't know, but she's, she obviously sees some potential violence in him. I'm guessing that she's seen his temper. She's seen a that, lot. She tells us a lot in the Netflix documentary. She does, she does, but she doesn't give us specific instances of violence. My point is that she knows this guy well enough. She knows that he probably has a temper. She implies that he's really impulsive. He has mood swings. We know he's a drug addict. We know that he has a past history of violence. We know that he can, he can lie, you know, lie through his teeth and smile at you. And we know that he's capable of stealing ten, over $10 million dollars from clients that desperately need the money. So is this someone who's capable of committing murder? I, you know, I don't know if the prosecution has answered that, but I've seen it. We see it. It's right in front of us. And if you take the history, including Morgan on Netflix saying, yes, I think this guy can commit murder. I, you know, whether the jury's convinced of that, I don't know, but I, I think, I think the the prosecution has laid out a pretty compelling case. So many thoughts. I want to bring up one thing you said that was really interesting because watching television, reality television, real television with Dr. John is always really interesting. And today as we were watching the trial and you already mentioned it, but I want to emphasize it when, when uh, Creighton Waters was trying to get him to say, yes, I lied to clients I lied to their face. I lied, you know, looking at them. As you point out, he could not do that. That was such a small thing. And he kept saying, look, I've come clean. I have financial crimes. I've lied. I don't know if I lied to their faces. Like he couldn't say it. And I want yeah. to point that out because you said that is him avoiding that shame. And I, yeah. that was an aha moment for me. So I just wanted to emphasize that. Right. When he was doing that, it reminded me. So I've done, I've done therapy groups over the years for a lot of felons, sex offenders, violent criminals. I've did, I've done therapy groups for at least, I don't know, 13, 15 years. And I don't do them anymore, but I've done them for years. And I told Lauren, this reminds me exactly of one of the felons sitting in my groups that's confronted about their behavior or part of their criminal behavior that they need to talk about openly in the group and they will not discuss it. They simply will not let you go there. They'll keep throwing up one defense after another. And 
It felt a lot like that. And I think the, the reason they do it, or one of the reasons they do it, is because they don't want to touch that shame. They don't want to get near that shame. It's too painful for them. And they want to throw up this barrier and, and keep you at a, a distance from any type of shame. And that's what it looks like. That's exactly what it looks like. They'll revert to something more general and abstract like he did. So instead of saying, yes, I looked Hakeem Pinckney in the eyes and I said, I'm going to steal your money. I mean, that's not what he said, but that's what he did. And so the prosecutor couldn't get him there because he wasn't allowing him, you know, he wasn't because Alec Murdoch was incapable of being vulnerable and allowing himself to feel the shame in that moment. And that's what, that's why he was pushing back and lashing out because Alec wanted to control the narrative at that time. It was something so simple and he could not say it. Thank you for sharing that. I, I have to say, Robin B stated, did you see the occasion, occasional sniffle? It seems psychological. I want to share some other things people are saying. Yeah. Um, Kathy and, said, and I, let me acknowledge that and just say yes, that I, I think, you know, Lauren and I were, were talking about it. We were watching it real time. And I think my comment was that this was the cycle, this was the cycle of going from experiencing some, some vulnerability and shame to total control and anger to get back to reassert his power. So that's what you saw. It was a constant oscillation or shuffle between this shame and this feeling of vulnerability and helplessness, even let's say that I think helplessness to Alec Murdoch is something that he simply does not want to get near. And so you, you see this oscillation between the helplessness and between the anger, between the, the need to reassert himself. Okay. Well then, so I want to go forward with that then, you know, <laughs> I'm going to talk from my innocent until proven guilty as always, <laughs> but I do not like Alec Murdoch <laughs> <laughs> and I don't like watching him and I'm, not triggered alone. By, <laughs> and I'm triggered by him. And I felt that this man from commenters today on national TV and people asking questions, they had more sympathy for Alec Murdoch than Let's just say Amber Heard seems more hated nationally than Alec Murdoch. Uh, you know, um, people were more had more solidarity around their dislike of Amber Heard during the Johnny Depp trial than they do with Alec Murdoch. Kathy earlier in our chat said, I know grieving and this man is grieving. Paula Marie, our, our wonderful listener, Paula Marie said, I think he feels terrified. Other people are saying, this was real. He is crying. There's no question. And I have to be honest, like, I want to scream when I see this stuff. Yeah, I, I hate <laughs> to break it to them. He's not. <laughs> can you share a little bit of that? Like, can you share I, what you're seeing when you see these tears? I know you just said it, but let's go a little bit further. Um, what is it when people are saying, no, this is real. No, this is genuine. What would you say to these people? I have the advantage of having worked with criminals for years. So I, I, I know what this is, right? But but many people, I think, when they see someone crying or, you know, one of the things about his crying is there weren't actually a lot of tears. So I I think it's a natural human instinct when you see someone that you believe is genuinely crying to feel for them. And so I, I understand why they would experience that, but... Is it real? I, I don't, I, you know, let me, in fairness, let me say that I think there could be some grief packed in there. I think that, I think that he's probably confused if he's experiencing some shame and helplessness, there probably is some confusion. There's, there's a lot of grief in this family that's never been expressed or processed. So I, I in fairness, I think there might be some grief in there. And I think he obviously recognizes that he's lost two people that he loves and he, you know, whether he has regrets or remorse about that, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I really think he committed these murders because he's, he's trying to protect the Murdoch empire and he's trying to protect the Murdoch myth of this family. And he was really angry at Paul for 
the boat crash, which started to unravel the whole operation. And he was angry at Maggie because I believe, as some of the documentaries have pointed out, that it was a bit of a myth that their per- their their marriage was perfect and that they were doing great as a couple. I don't think that's accurate. I think that they were probably struggling a little bit. She was spending most of her time at Odesto. So I think she was mad at, at Maggie for rejecting him possibly and for trying to decipher, or trying to figure out some of their financial issues. Bills weren't being paid. The bank account was being drawn overdrawn. She knew there were issues here. And by some accounts, she was asking for a financial accounting of his, his, his records, his bank records. So I think the whole thing, he knew that these two could blow up the entire enterprise. They could blow up the whole operation. And and that begins in 1920 with Randolph one. We talked about that last week, but this whole dynasty, this whole empire is in jeopardy. And he knows that. And the family knows it. There's a, there's a rumor, by the way, I, 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 there's a rumor from a really credible source. We have not talked to the source yet, but there, supposedly the night before the murders, somebody knew, and I'm not saying this is accurate or not, but it's out there, that Hansom told Alec, this is the night before, he told Alec, if you don't take care of Paul, I will. So he's essentially telling Alec, you protect this dynasty at all costs or I'm going to take care of it. Yeah, I'm on my I'm on my deathbed. Handsome would I'm on my deathbed, but if you don't do something, I will. I mean, and I don't know That doesn't necessarily mean he said go kill. No, 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 but it, it, But well, take care of know. this. Like this know. is a I don't problem. know what it means. This is I, a problem means... for our family. It's a problem for our legacy. This is a problem for it, the Murdochs, the enmeshed Murdoch family. It means that you put the family dynasty above your child and your your wife. That's what it means. Thank you. Um, Kubro writes, I'm not a member, so I doubt my question will be seen. We're seeing it. And by the way, we do look at all questions. It is easier to see members' questions. They're a different color for us. We're doing our best, but we do look at everyone's questions. Uh, so thank you for writing this. They say, did Alex tell, excuse me, Alec, tell the prosecutor that the boat case was the reason this happened, the motive? He said when being questioned that someone hated Paul because of the boat crash. And I thought him. Yeah. So that yeah, was, was a great moment. I wanted to read It was a great moment. It was a great moment towards the end of the trial or towards the end of the, the cross examination of Alec when Alec said, and this is a quote, I believe the boat wreck is the reason why Paul and Maggie were killed. What, what Alec meant by that comment was essentially he believed that somebody was so angry at Paul for the boat wreck. He didn't mean, he didn't mean the immediate, members of the family that were in the boat wreck, like Mallory's family. But he believed that somebody on social media, some vigilante, this is the theory they're advancing as, as, as Creighton Waters pointed out, there's zero evidence of this, by the way, but the theory they're advancing essentially is that some vigilante, some angry vigilante wanted to get back at Paul. Doesn't explain why Maggie would have been killed by the way, but wanted to get back at Paul because of the boat wreck. And so killed him that evening. Of course, you know, as a psychologist, my first thought is, okay, he just told, right, he basically just told us why he killed them. Yeah, he's right. The boat wreck is the reason, but it's not a vigilante, it's him. Because the boat wreck is the unraveling of the Murdoch dynasty. And that's what he wants to protect at all costs. So uh, to me, it was it was an extraordinary moment, just not for the reasons he thought. His argument is that vigilante do it. Of course, did it. Of course, that's there's zero evidence of that whatsoever. The the defense doesn't have to advance or prove that theory, but they're putting it out there without any evidence. And uh, you know, a, a vigilante would have to be pretty, pretty, 
<laughs> I, you know, pretty angry and 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 unconcerned about the consequences of committing a murder murder over a boat crash two years earlier that they had nothing to do with. I, I don't know, but so is the boat wreck the reason? Yep, he's sure right about that. I want to say something about the tears too, and then I want to read Emily's question here. Um, just remember again, when you have sympathy, I think you're right, Dr. John, we all feel sympathy for people that are crying and maybe there is some truth to his tears, but just remember Hakeem Pinkney, remember what he did to Gloria Satterfield's son. Remember Mallory Beach and how he didn't seem to care about her parents, you know, just remember when his who, life is how on much the line, he gave others. when his life is on the line and he's a one down position and doesn't have the power, he sure brings, he brings on the tears, but when he's in a powerful position and he has control over everything, the narrative, the Murdoch dynasty finances, he's completely without remorse. He has no problem stealing people's money, people that need that money desperately. He's showing up the night of the boat crash within hours. He's showing up with his badge in the hospital, trying to get people, trying to cover it up, essentially. Trying to say that Connor Cook is driving the boat so that his son Paul can get off scot-free. Right. Emily asks, do you think Alec is surprised that this has become a murder charge since Paul was disliked after the boat crash? Do you think Alec assumed the public wouldn't care about his murder? Can I say something before you answer? Yep. I think this might be true. I've had the same question, though. I want to know what you think, because I want to know um, that he didn't care about Mallory Beach. He didn't care about Hakeem. He didn't care about Stephen Smith. So why would he think someone's going to care about his own son. I just want to throw that out. What do you think, Dr. John? I, I think he's stunned that he's sitting in the on the stand answering questions from the prosecution. I think he's absolutely stunned because he's a Murdoch and he never would have imagined that it could have come to this. Yes. Thank you. Colette and, and again, the, the the evidence for him being stunned is the fact that he, he's he's so angry on the stand. Colette is reminding everyone, if you're wondering about the Patreon membership, you join here. She put the post in comments or in the chat, excuse me, uh, patreon.com slash hidden true crime slash posts. If you want to join the YouTube membership, you have to be on a desktop or browser to join. We have no idea why we hope that YouTube fixes that soon, but in order to see joint membership, thanks for explaining that Colette. We do have to end soon. I am going to be on News Nation tonight on Banfield. We're going to continue the conversation there on some Murdoch theories. There have been a lot of great questions. Many I actually wrote down, but I'd like to end with one last question, John, and I'll let you end. Okay. okay. If you were Creighton Waters, if you were on the prosecution, <laughs> what would you ask Alec on the stand what would you try to do with him there? Um, and then anything else you want to add? I, I think I, <laughs> I think it's it's a little hard for me to answer this question because I'm more of a clinical person. So I think if if I were Creighton Waters, I probably I probably would have called out some of his anger and some of his some of those psychological moments when I felt like he was trying to ex exert power because I think it would have showed the jury that this is someone, you know, when Alex says, let's get this done quickly. I think, you know, Creighton Waters was kind of stunned by that moment, by the way, he was taken aback and he's like, no, we're not going to get it done quickly. So Creighton kind of reacted in his own way by reasserting his power and, and showing Alex that he's in control. But but I think my my response to something like that would have been to kind of pause and and say, um, "Excuse me, what what did you do? What did you, what did you just say that you want this done quickly?" Okay, well, you know. In other words, I think for me, I would pr approach it more clinically and kind of point out how his behaviors are 
are showing us who he is, that they're a little over the top at times, that they're controlling, that he's in a bit of a power struggle with the prosecutor. I, I you know, I don't know if the jury's going to see that, but but I, I think I would be more apt to to highlight those moments and to to say essentially something like, do you see what you're doing here? Do you see how this anger is showing us who you are? are? Do you realize that you're showing us that you're someone who's quite capable of committing murder under the right circumstances and with, with the same kind of anger that you're now showing us? But, you know, I don't, lawyers, you know, my training is quite different. So I don't, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I think so for me, I I'd be more apt to, to show the jury what I'm seeing in real time, which is this is someone who's really angry that he doesn't have power, that he's lost control of the narrative. And now even on the stand fighting for his life, he's really kind of giving us a glimpse of, of who he really is. Thank you, Dr. John. We are going to continue this conversation tomorrow. As soon as this live ends, you will see a redirect to tomorrow's live. So when that page comes up, hit the notification button. We're going to go live tomorrow at 5 p.m. Pacific. That's 6 Mountain, 7 Central, 8 Eastern. Did I do it? Did I do my... Uh, and, and then for our overseas... Our overseas listeners, you're on your own there. It's it's. Um, <laughs> I've got the U.S. down, but I don't. But uh, John, why don't you share one last thing, and and I'll jump on. I wanna, yeah, I want to share some research by James Gilligan. I mentioned Gilligan a lot. He wrote a book called Violence. He the, the book I'm holding is called Preventing Violence. James Gilligan is a psychiatrist. He's done research. He's interviewed a number of violent criminals over the years, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna summarize his take on on why people commit violent crimes. And here's what he says. The basic psychological motive or cause of violent behavior is the wish to ward off or eliminate the feeling of shame and humiliation, a feeling that is painful and can even be intolerable and overwhelming. And to replace it with its opposite, the feeling of pride. So if you want to know why Alec Murdoch might be able to commit murder. You're seeing it right there. You're seeing him trying to cope with shame and humiliation and how painful that is for him, how intolerable and overwhelming it is. And you're trying to see him replace it with its opposite, which is pride. And pride, by the way, is exactly what the Murdoch dynasty has, has really owned and expressed for nearly a hundred years. And so this is in some ways that a tension between shame and pride and, uh, or I might say even between strength and weakness. If you think of pride as being a version of strength, and if you see shame as being a version of weakness, then in some ways this is an attempt to reassert the Murdoch's strength as a family, as a dynasty, and Alec is well on his way to, to obviously tearing down that whole empire. And so I think that's, that's part of what's going on here. Thank you, John. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Come join us over on Banfield right now. I'm going to hop on over there to talk on News Nation. Join us tomorrow. Again, there will be a link at the end of this video. Hit the notification. And we'll see all of you tomorrow. Leave your questions for tomorrow's live in the comments of this video. And we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone, and right. have a great Good night. night. Good night.